I'd like to provide some of the highlights from a recent report we published on the exchanges, looking at both equities exchanges and derivative exchanges. Really, the course of the past few years have been a dramatic period for exchanges. They're as profitable as they've never been before and are generating revenues and profits that are really the envy of the entire financial services industry. If we look in this chart, a sort of brief breakdown of the different sources of revenues, we can see that things have progressively grown over the course of the past few years, and we expect this growth rate to continue. However, growth within the different revenue sources are not evenly distributed. Some areas are growing much more quickly than others. In particular, if we look at market data, we see that's been growing at over 10% per year over the course of the past few years. This reflects a quite deliberate strategy on the part of, of, uh, of deriv derivatives and equities exchanges to focus their activity more on non-cyclical sources of revenues. Rather than be transaction-based, they are rather trying to be subscription-based and trying to drive more revenue in that direction. Also, particularly derivative exchanges and exchanges outside of the US have been able to drive revenues towards market data. In the US, equities exchanges are quite constrained by the, uh, the market data plans put in place by the SEC, so they don't have free pricing control over their market data the way derivatives exchanges have or the way European and Asian stock exchanges have. As dramatic as the growth has been overall in terms of revenues, even more impressive are the fantastic profit margins that exchanges have been able to generate over the course of the past few years. Uh, in particular, if we look at the last year, 2015, and the kinds of revenues and profit margins, it's absolutely spectacular. But it's interesting that it's, of course, not uniform across different exchanges. Some are better than others, some have greater growth and less growth, some are more profitable and less profitable. But if you look at this chart, you can see that things do sort of fall into a number of convenient buckets. We see, for example, the cash cows here in the middle. Exchanges such as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange, or the Japan Exchange, having really monumentally large um, uh, profit margins. However, they're not growing particularly quickly. They have a growth rates of under about 10% per year, which is quite respectable in most business, but phenomenal profit margins. Further over to the left, we see firms, uh, exchanges that are very, very profitable, but are shrinking, at least in terms of dollar terms. And I would point out that the shrinkage we see here is more to do with their own currencies collapsing than any particular weakness on the part of the exchanges. But unfortunately, they are in markets where the currencies are falling quite quickly, be it Brazil or Russia. So compared to dollars, in dollar terms, we've seen a reduction there. Further towards the bottom here, we sort of see exchanges that are less profitable and have very low growth rates. Uh, surprisingly, BATS, for example, an exchange that's been able to wrest market share away from incumbents in the US and in Europe, is actually quite an unprofitable exchange, at least compared to other exchanges. Uh, compared to most f financial institutions, most broker-dealers, that would be an absolute envious position to be in, to have a 35% profit margin. However, in the exchange space, that's not the case. They're actually quite far behind where other firms would be. That's in part a reflection of a deliberate strategy. Exchanges historically were not for-profit entities and were really uh, entities run in the interests of their members, of the broker-dealers that made up the membership of the exchanges. And so the profits that they generated or the cost savings they allowed people to generate were really didn't appear on their income statements but rather their users. Off to the right on the fact we have the Hong Kong exchanges which are absolutely spectacular growing at over 40% a year, profit margins close to 80%, uh, it seems a very enviable place to be. It seems it's only really possible in China. Unfortunately, the Shanghai uh, Stock Exchange and other Chinese stock exchanges don't really publish these numbers, so we're not really sure what's going on inside. They treat those kind of information as state secrets, and it's very hard to see what's going on there. On this chart, you see the different revenue mix that exchanges have. So it's, it's a highly heterogeneous group of people. We've removed uh, revenue sources here that are really not exchange related at all. So for example, in 2015, the London Stock Exchange derived a, a large portion of its revenues from an asset management firm that it had, it had uh, acquired. We've removed that to normalize it, facilitate a real uh, a comparison between the different exchanges. Um, so you see very heterogeneous. Some exchanges get a large amount of their revenues from IT services. NASDAQ is certainly the leader in that space. Others are heavily reliant on clearing. Certainly the large derivatives exchanges, be it Eurex, be it CME or ICE, are heavily dependent on, on clearing, while others have substantial listing services. I would encourage you to study these numbers in the report and get a better feel for them. 
If we look at overall equities trading volumes, it's interesting to see that neither Europe uh, nor the US have quite recovered the volumes that we saw uh, just before the financial crisis, or while the financial crisis was unfolding in 2008. So it seems that US markets finally got back to more or less, less those volumes, not quite there. Uh, Europe's been lagging significantly behind that and never has recovered those peaks, uh, while China's absolutely been exploding. Uh, of course, in 2015, we saw this enormous spike in Chinese stock market prices, an enormous spike in trading volumes, both going up and then collapsing down as it came back down. But it seems that now the annual value of stock trading in China is more than twice as much as the European market. So it's become a very, very significant player virtually overnight. If we look at derivatives exchanges, we can see uh, a fairly heterogeneous distribution in terms of who's growing and who's shrinking. Uh, CME doing quite nicely, ICE and Eurex uh, either declining slightly in terms of volumes or remaining the same. Uh, but nevertheless, these exchanges remain very, very profitable, both in terms of their trading activities and their clearing activities. Of course, over the course of the past many years, and here we see the past 15 years, we've seen a huge number of exchange mergers. Uh, exchange mergers have become very current again as ICE, CME and Deutsche Börse have announced they're interested in acquiring the London Stock Exchange. In fact, down in the bottom part of this chart, you see the London Stock Exchange and Deutsche Börse, and they've actually been compared to their competitors quite tame in terms of their mergers and acquisitions. Uh, London Stock Exchange has frequently been the target of acquisitions, uh, be it from NASDAQ, be it Deutsche Börse or a handful of other firms. But the only really large uh, acquisition or merger that the LSC engaged in was with Borsa Italiana going back some years now. Deutsche Börse seems very keen on addressing that and correcting that and wants to acquire them. Uh, ICE and CME have announced that they're going to throw their hat into the, into the ring as well and try and, and play in there as well. But you see really a bewildering range, range of acquisitions taking place between the different exchanges. NASDAQ really be very active in terms of acquiring European exchanges in the Nordic area. Uh, we see uh, ICE has really been acquiring things all over the place, though interestingly ICE actually spun off Euronext uh, and decided that there was too much, too difficult to actually integrate that into the New York Stock Exchange and decided it would be a better idea to simply spin it off. But this is a global phenomenon and we see firms around the world really trying to get the scale and volume necessary to be as profitable as possible. Here we see the logic of these kinds of acquisitions and mergers. We see a scale curve and the basic reasoning in, uh, is that it is a scale business with a very substantial fixed cost. So any additional transactions you can get through your systems really leads to a much reduced cost per transaction. So you can see this nice scale curve. Unfortunately, many exchanges have not been able to achieve that, particularly when it's been a question of intercontinental mergers. So if you look at a merger, for example, between the New York Stock Exchange and Euronext, they were never really able to integrate their systems and never achieve the cost savings that you would expect to see an exchange of that size achieve. And really that's a, difference, a, a, a question of different regulatory environments, uh, different de facto ways of doing business and business conduct between those different markets. It's very, very hard to consolidate on a single platform. Some firms have been able to do it. Euronext, for example, quite successfully, the merger of many different European exchanges has migrated to one single platform. And that's essential if you're going to be able to move down the scale curve and achieve lower cost per transaction. Finally, I'd like to talk a bit about where future opportunities lie. Most players in this market don't really expect that these times are going to continue. Uh, 70 or 80 percent profit margins attract external competitors. Other people are going to come in and try and make hay in this space as well. So exchanges should be thinking about what happens in the future. And in this chart, we show where the opportunities lie, what exchanges could be doing and thinking about. There's some obvious expansion areas, for example, market data, as I mentioned before, that has become a major area of emphasis for exchanges. It accounts for an ever increasing proportion of exchange revenues. But there are other areas outside of that that exchanges should be thinking about. For example, interdealer brokers offer a very interesting expansion potential. And I don't only mean the electronic trading uh, aspect of interdealer brokers. That's a fairly obvious expansion opportunity. And in fact, exchanges already do exactly what interdealer brokers, electronic trading platforms do. I'm more talking about the voice of brokering side where exchanges could potentially get involved in that and try and get volume in OTC derivatives, markets they're currently shut out of. Another very interesting area for expansion is basically the sell side. Historically, the sell side 
of course, have been the owners and members of the exchanges, the primary customers of exchanges, and there have been some points of friction between that. Exchange has been very, very timid about getting into the sell side space. There's a whole variety of different order types and algorithmic trading, analytics, things of that sort that exchanges could, in my opinion, be providing and moving into. With the sell side actually receding, with greater capital controls, uh, capital requirements on the sell side, we see basically a bunch of sell side firms reducing their trading activities, be it on the fixed income side as well as equities. And I believe this creates an opportunity for exchanges to step in that, take up the slack. Uh, however, as I said before, they've been quite timid about doing so, quite reluctant on stepping those toes in the sell side space. Unfortunately for exchanges, sell side firms are not reluctant about stepping on exchanges' toes. So ultimately, we explain exchanges' mentality there has to change and they have to become somewhat more aggressive about entering into that space because that's an, a ready area for expansion for exchanges. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or download the report from our website. Thank you very much.